Hello and welcome to another Oxford Sandy and Black Big Group podcast. I'm your regular host, Andrew O'Shea. Um, I'm recording the intro to this podcast today. Um, it's Friday evening about 6.30, South Lincolnshire. Clear blue sky, a bit of a chilled wind. Um, standing down the end of the farm with a dog who's taken an interest in what's going on down the riverbank. Um, I see a few hares in the field. It's a, it's a very nice evening, although it's a little bit nippy, so I do have a coat on to keep warm. But uh, yes, it's uh, spring has finally sprung and it's, it's a nice time of year. Um, but this week's episode of the podcast is uh, a play of the um, event where we invited AHDB um, and Emily Boyce to come and talk to us about small-scale pig producers um, and a little bit about TB and pigs, um, which is a very useful session. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. Before we get to that, a couple of couple of uh, news items, I guess. Uh, number one, the next event is on the 22nd of April. That is an event with... Um, Lucia Gregson, she's going to come and talk to us um, about AI and pigs and sperm and and spermogenesis. Um, Those who don't know, Lucia is a graduate um, of the Harper Adams University, one of the big veterinary medical schools in in the country. So that'd be a really useful session. Um, And also, this past weekend, I was very lucky to have Nigel Goodchild, um, who's a lifelong butcher, come up to do my holding and butcher a couple of pigs for me um the the idea behind that was to really put a video series together for um our group members um so they can see up close and in detail how to break down a pig from nose to snout and hopefully instill some you know encourage people maybe with next time they send a pig off get half back for themselves and have a go at butchering just for their own consumption obviously because you can't sell it unless you're licensed but you know um just to save a few pounds on the costs and have a go um you know it's not as difficult as it looks um i can assure you of that um so that'll be a small series five or six episodes um starting at the beginning of may well for the news items uh, and updates um as always there's the weekly stock list sheet that goes out um if you're looking for stock have stock for sale or can't you know you're struggling to find something then please reach out to kim or myself um and we can add you to that list um and also there's the newsletter that goes out on a quarterly basis the previous one went out beginning of april um, and that had a huge response so you can also sign up for that um via the website um, there's a link there on the top right hand side anyway i'm starting to waffle so i will leave it there and hand over um, to the replay of the event uh, and i hope you enjoy okay. lovely all right i can see kim's nodding head that's good um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining this evening. Um, we, we've been invited by um, Kim and Andrew and the charity to do an overview and then Pat's going to touch her, um, on TV and pigs um, after I've done my bit of spiel. Um, so I thought it would be quite good um, to do a bit of a proper introduction to me and hello. So um, I'm from... Gloucestershire and I, um, not from farming background, um, I had a bit of an obsession with Babe when I was little, um, watched it a lot of times in the cinema, uh, when she, when it came out and had a pot bellied pig, um, I wanted to quit school and be a farmer, but I didn't, I had to stay there. Um, I went to Hartbury College in Gloucester, um, did a year of A-levels, hated it, and then went up the farm um, and did a two-year course up there. Um, and it's there that I fell in love with pigs. And I got my tattoo, um, which is here now forever. But I still love it, so that's fine. Um, after college, went and worked on a dairy farm. Um, and I did the odd bit of um, milk recording for, the, um, for NMR. So um, along with some relief work for road hogs as well. So I sort of tried to keep my foot um, in the door with pigs for definite. Um, Through road hogs, I went over to America um, and worked on a um, 7,000 sow unit over there. Um, God, I do look very baby faced. So that was um, a real eye opener. It was fantastic. Um, came home 
and um, worked in um, countrywide. So it was a sort of nice mix between people and animals. Um, I could still advise, I could still, I still did my um, milk recording and different things. So that was great for all manner of skills that I was able to sort of um, pick up. Um, great team. And um, I went on to do um, win the SQP of the year um, for pets in 2015. So that was a particular highlight of mine, not farming related, um, but it was great. Um, I then went back to Hartbury um, where I met my first desk, I guess. I've always been really, really practical, hands-on. Um, and I had a great academic support network there, but it just, teaching wasn't necessarily for me. Um, so while I was all there as well, um, as I said, it was great. I, my main love there, I did the, um, assisted in managing a red deer herd there. Um, and it, yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. That was my highlight in that particular role. And I'm the person that has the annoying pet wherever I go, I'm afraid. So that, that was my uh, taggy there. Um, and I guess, so, so that aside, now, when I started HDB, um, I started in August 2018. Um, and I started as a maternity cover for the skills development officer um, role in the pork team. Um, that included the organisation of stock person training, um, reviewing the content and session briefs um, with the team. Um, I'm still doing some of that at the moment. Um, another part um, of that first role was next generation work. Um, so that was sort of enticing new entrants into the industry. Um, the Pig Industry Scholarship Programme, um, we run with Harper Adams. Um, and this year we're actually um, having a student ourselves in the team. So that would be, um, it's really great to be able to support something that we've initially set up. Um, at the end of 2019, um, I took on a couple of pig clubs um, and the small scale producer work from Lucia. So I know. Um, Lots of you knew Lucia, so that was a really big step for me, um, being able to, to take on this work. Um, so I'm now six months in, um, and I haven't met anybody face to face. Um, there's been lots of changes, which I'm, I'll you know sort of cover in a little bit um, to the team and what we do. Um, so it's been it has been a bit difficult. Um, but we have I've been able to um, sort of be part of that change um, and work in. So it's been it has been really great. Um, I'm just looking forward to getting out to see everybody again. <laughs> um, so and then I guess on the side, um, I do my own, um, not my own. That's rubbish. Uh, I do two lots of lambing for different people um, throughout the year. And um, I also work up at Broadway Tower, so I still kept the deer sort of, uh, sort of in there. So that's me. Um, with just thought it'd be a um, good introduction. Um, so going on to um, sort of HDB and um, what we do. So this here is our vision statement, um, and I thought it was really important to start with it as it's our sort of guiding purpose. Um, inspiring our farmers, growers and industry to succeed in a rapidly changing world. Um, that is, you know, the ideal that our missions and values that we work for build towards. So um, I'm now going to hopefully you know, go to here for Jen to uh, I'm just going to let play um, a part of recording from um, our national 
Jen explains it a lot better than I do. <laughs> I guess the the first question is where do we get our money um, and we are as you, you all will be aware we are funded through levy payers so um, it's a mandatory levy um, the levy is taken from producers at the processor level so if you click onto the next slide M um, dependent on which sector you're in um, the levy is collected in completely different ways, which means that the different six sectors of HDB have different relationships with their levy payers. Some of them don't really know who the levy payers are because they come through a third, the money comes through a third party. Other people have quite close relationships and, and can identify exactly who their levy payers are. We're in Pork, we're pretty lucky because it all comes through um, processes. So we've got that access where we know who our, who our levy payers are. Um, and yes, yeah, so and the money comes into us. Um, one of the things that I get asked an awful lot is, you know, if if the if the levy comes into us, does it get spent in our sector? And it absolutely does. So um, if the pork levy comes into pork, we're not going to spend up it on potatoes and vice versa. So um, we've really got to make sure that we get the biggest bang for our buck with the money that comes into us. The levy hasn't actually changed. Um, the individual fee of the levy for a really long time um, but it means that what we want is you guys to be as productive as you can be because it's on a per head basis the more productive you are the more pigs that go through the supply chain the more levy we get the more we can help so it's um, it's self prophecy um, if you like it self perpetuates if you like um, so it's in our interests to make you guys as profitable as you can so that we can continue to help you be as profitable as you can, if that makes any sense at all. Um, so that's kind of where uh, the background to the levy and, and how that all works. Um, next slide is, so what do we do with it? So we get this levy in every year. It, it works out at about £11 million. Pounds. Where, does, where does that money go? What do we spend it on? How do we decide what we spend it on? Um, and really, it's in it's in two distinct areas with lots of work behind them. If you click onto the next slide, M, it's all about reputation. So everything that we're we're doing is about the reputation of the pig, pig industry, either through doing lots of work that helps protect the industry, or through doing lots of work that promotes the industry and ultimately helping with the industry's integrity. So a couple of examples, um, things that we do to protect um, are things like um, the animal health and welfare work that we do, working with um, pig health and welfare charters, um, things that we do to promote all of our work around marketing and export. And, and all of this ultimately is for the benefit of the industry. Um, Emma, if you wanna, if you wanna click on. So this is another one of these Mythbusters that I've, I've been asked whilst I've been working um, with HDB um, is things like, well, why don't you go to, why don't you go to government and tell them? Because we're not a lobby organisation um, and ultimately we report into DEFRA. So we are an arm's length government organisation. We we are our own organisation, but we report into them. So we can't lobby them. But what we can do and what we do do is provide scientific evidence. Um, and with that information, we can then advise government and lobby organisations. So there's some good examples of this recently where there's been lots of talk about um, Germany and how Germany banned farrow is looking to ban farrowing crates. And that led to lots of conversations about what would that look like for our industry. And we provided the facts. It wasn't um, it wasn't pro or con. It was just the facts of if we went down either route, these would be the implications. We provided that to the likes of um, the National Pig Association, who can then take that information because it's all publicly available, can take that information and use it to lobby government if they wanted to. Um, so everything that we do is, it's all about transparency, um, it's all about it being robust, um, and us being able to, to prove 
what, what we're saying. Um, em, do you want to click on? So we'll, I'll just talk um, really top line about some of the different things that we do around promoting. And this is really just a taster. So if you hear something that you think, oh, that's pretty interesting, then the idea is if you let Em know, and we can get some of the people that do that in, in depth to come along and, and talk to you guys um, a bit more about what we do. But um, if we just move on. So the first, the first thing, I'm starting at one end of the world and I'll, I'll work my way back. So I'll start as far away as we can. What we do to promote, um, we've got a, a full export team. This includes um, Holly, who's, who's there on the Asia Pacific team, who lives in China. So we're, we're, we're right across the globe. We've got an Asia Pacific team, a European team, an America's team. We've got people that work on policy, people that work on getting market access. Um, and these are all about promoting British so that we can export goods into those markets and opening those doors. And this team, um, they work really closely with our processors. So Jono, um, who sits on the Asia Pacific team, will work really closely with uh, the likes of Cranswick or Pilgrims or Carroll, and they'll have an export manager as well. And they'll go together to these different countries working at trade shows or at different events or, or getting product out there or um, doing videos based in based in the UK that they can then showcase out there, all about trying to open up those markets. Um, China has been a really positive thing for us over the last few years, but we need to make sure we don't put all our eggs in one basket. So um, that's why we're, we're working right across the globe. Europe, uh, everything changed on January the 1st. So it's still about maintaining those relationships and, and working through all of those um, those teething problems that we've had since we've since we've left the EU, hence some of the uh, movement license stuff that we're going to talk about later on. But this is this is our export team. It's all about helping us with, with this carcass balance um, and, and getting our product out and also making sure that product that comes in is appropriate as well. So that's that's those guys, and they're very, very interesting. Um, Something that's probably a bit more creative is our um, a market, domestic marketing team. So coming closer to home, um, this team, a lot of people don't realize, but things like the, uh, if you've seen it, the mix up midweek, um, perfect pulled pork adverts, they're, they're AHDB, um, the We Eat Balanced work that was out earlier in this year, that's AHDB as well. Um, and the, the, this team works really hard on promoting um, promoting British within our market and trying to make sure that we're utilizing the carcass in the best way that we can. Um, and there's a really good example of that. So, and if you just click onto the next slide, last year when, um, when COVID happened and when the world shut, um, and people stopped going out to restaurants um, and stopped going to McDonald's and all those places. Um, the food service market just shut. And that food service market is where the majority of our pork shoulder goes. Um, we had a campaign planned that was around um, loin medallions. And we realized actually we really didn't need that campaign around loin medallions because they weren't a problem because a lot more people were eating at home we really needed a campaign around pork shoulder. Um, and we had a previous campaign. So the pulled pork campaign that we'd run a couple of years before, quickly turned it around and got it back out. And these are the results um, of the, the volume of sales during that time. So it was for um, a six week period, um, the data at the bottom there ended 31st of May, um, and I'll, although I can't say 100% hand on heart, this is all because of this campaign, the fact that the pork shoulder went up, sales went up 35% during that time, you've got to think that there is a correlation to the marketing that we do. So it, it just demonstrates that actually, if you're giving out the right message at the right time in the right place, you can help um, move what's going on which I think is, is quite interesting, certainly for you guys, if any of you have got um, your own farm shops and are, and are selling things um, as well. 
Right, so that's um, Jen. Hopefully um, that's given you all a bit of a um, taster of what, um, you know, a, a pretty good insight into what we do. Um, I figured the next part would be good to go um, to show you um, who um, is behind HDB Pork um, and a bit of a visual on the distribution across the UK. Um, so there has been some changes in the structure and the ways that we work over the last um, couple of years. We've had a rejig um, of the regions. So we did used to have four. We used to have um, a central region in there, but we've now um, split um, just between north, east and south. So you've got um, knowledge exchange managers who are myself, Pat and Andrew Palmer. Um, and we'll, we um, are focusing on farm excellence um, platform, monitor farm work, pig clubs, um, on a very much a one-to-many approach. Um, and for technical support, um, that's where we'll be sort of signposting small scale producers to. Um, and then you've also got the knowledge exchange relationship managers. Um, so this is a, an approach which is sort of one to few um, working with the larger levy payers um, and industry stakeholders. And that's come about through um, sort of what the industry fed back to us. Um, and they still support us very heavily. So that's um, Sam Bradley in the north, Tina um, in the south, and Pippa um, in the east. So, and Pippa's also our senior knowledge exchange manager. And then you've got Jen at the top there. Um, and then we've also got the, sorry, the knowledge transfer team. Um, so they are responsible for transferring the data and the knowledge um, that we find and putting it back out to you guys. Um, so you may come across them um, through different, if they're specific um, questions. Um, and that's Ben, senior, he's the um, senior knowledge transfer manager. And then you've got James and Sunita. Um, so how do we get all the information out and what does it look like? Um, the Farm Excellent program um, is about demonstrating to farmers new ideas, new um, innovations and learnings um, and technical knowledge. So largely through peer-to-peer -peer learning. So from producer to, from producer, to producer. Um, that is, um, yeah. So that's fine. Sorry, I've lost my lost my trail of thought there. Um, so the strategic farms, they're very specific, um, taking um, those farms on a journey, technical journey that um, we then, as a case study, will um, share with the industry. Um, you've got Precision Pig as the example there, but you've also got, um, and that's all around data. And then you've also got farms that focus on water quality and um, tail docking. Um, the monitor farms, so they are more prominent um, in mine and Pat's role now. Um, and that's through the Smart, Smart Pork program. And that's a bit more of a holistic approach to the business as a whole um, and looking at minimising wastes and increasing productivity. Um, and that's through lean management. Um, technical events, so um, that's conferences, study study tours. Um, this year, um, it's Pigs Tomorrow, which is happening later on in the year, which is our main, main focus in that area. Um, and then you've, of course, got the pig clubs and producer groups. Um, and that's going forwards, we're going to be looking at blended approaches of this. So um, digital and face to face, because um, we know that we can reach the people, uh, more people in this way, because everybody's different um, and sort of likes to, to learn differently. And that's, that's 
how we're um, sort of taking the national pig club um, approach with the digital um, and and the regional, but all of it, small scale producers as well. Here we are. Um, so uh, so um, I think it's important um, when it comes to the small scale producer work. We do work closely with the BPA. Um, we focus on protecting and promoting and the reputation, as we mentioned earlier on, and they focus on the conservation and the breeding um, and the security of those native breeds. So um, there's some sort of new strategic plans that are being discussed this spring. So it should be um, a really good, um, a strong connection going forwards um, between, between the two of us. So that's great. Um, so tools and services that are available that we, um, through AHDB, so you've got um, three main areas, you've got the animal health and welfare, um, you've got the electronic uh, EMB, the electronic medicine book, um, which um, is used to record more accurate on-farm antibiotic usage, um, the EAML2, which um, many of you will be familiar with due to movement licenses on farm, um, swine dysentery charter, you've got the British pig health scheme, um, and we do a lot of work on disease surveillance as well. And that's all um, sort of pulled together through Pig Hub. Um, the environment and resource management is becoming um, an increasing um, area of interest um, and that we support that through ammonia um, research carbon audit, auditing and sort of liaising with those um, with other large um, companies such as the Environment Agency. The third um, area where we um, have a, quite a few tools is when it comes to the business um, and insights and skills that's where um, we've got our pig pro um, recording tool that's for recording training um, and I think Nikki may have, have um, touched on that beforehand with um, one of her um, sessions with you guys uh, the stockment development courses and the pig production webinars um, Agri Leader, Smart Fork, and as I mentioned earlier on, Pig Industry Scholarship. So um, sort of trying to in encourage um, people into the industry that way. So how do we do it? Um, we've got a digital approach, um, which we've always had. Um, if you're not signed up, um, to get the pork weekly and the information, then we've, I don't, I'm not sure if it's full yet. Um, you've got the um, keeping in touch um, form that you can fill out online. So that's a weekly newsletter that um, brings HDB updates um, to market information, um, innovating stories, whatever's happening at the time, straight to your inbox every Friday. Um, you've got the abattoir meat processor news and that's a quarterly email um, that is aimed at abattoirs and processors and you can click on to get those uh, and then you've got we've got magazine and paper articles so um, you've got pink pages um, that's three pages of HDB content um, in the pig world magazine monthly um, and then you've also got the practical pigs um, that we do spread in there as well um, of topical um, topics at the time. Um, so our website, there is so much information on there. Um, this, I think, is one of our uh, most impressive tools, really. Um, we've got a small scale and um, producer specific page um, where you can find, um, I'll pop it all up really. Um, you've got the new pig keepers guide there um, with contingency planning for um, pig keepers um, and 
also the uh, where you can order any signs um, and resources posters um, through the pork order form um, you've got the code of practice for the welfare of pigs and the pig veterinary society casualty pig um, on there um, and then you've also got our webinar series that we ran at the end of last year the principles of pig production um, which really took you from um, from the very beginning of the production cycle straight through the, the, the whole process through to finishing um, so that was a really um, a, a really good resource there um, and then you have also got um, the rest you've got lots on smart pork there um, and lots of different I know it's, it's a bit different to how um, our old website looked but all the content is there um, and if you need any help uh, with sort of finding that then that's what we're here for if you if you can't seem to get hold of it um, and then other just other um, things that we've got going on we've always got our events on um, and pig pro that goes alongside that to record those on um, we do an awful lot of work of trying to make sure that the right people get um, the right invites um, and we try constantly trying to make sure that um, we're reaching the right people and then you've got also um, lots of work on markets um, with the SPP and pricing and um, uh, the pork market outlook um, all available um, oh and along with podcasts as well so that is my section done Pat are you ready yes I am um, oh, just a little brief snippet on bovine TB in pigs. Uh, it's, it's uncommon, but it's uh, slightly more common than it was. So some of the signs um, are coughing, breathing problems, loss of condition, loss of appetite. It is a debilitating disease and if you see no improvement from a respiratory infection after antibiotics, um, it would pay to get advice from your vet. Um, numbers are very low, or cases are low, but there are numbers recorded, uh, cases recorded each year. Um, how it's spread. Uh, it can be spread to your pig from infected cattle, Infected wild animals such as deer and badgers. Infected non-bovine animals introduced into your herd. Um, it can spread directly from animal to animal, although our, our, I believe there's actually only one case of it ever being found being transferred from pig to pig. Um, or it can be uh, spread from contaminated manure, urine, bedding, feed, water, slurry, equipment. Um, and probably you're thinking, can it be spread from um, animals to people? Yes, it can. And the same again, I believe there has only been one case reported, recorded of it definitely being spread from a pig to uh, a human. Um, but it can be spread by breathing in the animal's breath, touching the animal's waist, uh, have scut, cut skin and the animal's carcass, um, or eaten dairy products from unpasteurized milk from affected dairy, uh, from affected dairy animals. If you suspect EB, you must immediately contact the APHA. So, or your vet. Um, so although that was, yeah, although that was based very top line and looking at um, households and we'll do work where we look work with retailers and with food service um, we've actually got coming finished then carry on sorry <laughs> <laughs> 
I thought someone was uh, interrupting. Well, they were. Um, yeah, so if you suspect BB, you must immediately contact the APHA um, or your vet. Um, if it's a uh, carcass you've got, you should keep the, the carcass on your premises, isolated as far as is practical from other livestock until an investigation has been carried out. Um, if there is a suspected case, you must allow an APHJ vet to test your animal for TB. Um, if TB is found, uh, APA has statutory powers in England to slaughter and remove livestock of any species that test positive for TB. You'll then uh, have movement restrictions uh, imposed upon you until you've got uh, two clear tests. Um, and a lot of slaughterhouses won't deal at the moment with uh, a farm that has been found TB positive because if they take a um, pigs in slaughter, they then cannot uh, export to China. Um, so if you are found positive, it will, uh, there is compensation available uh, and it is for animals weighing less than 25 kilo, a 30 pound compensation. Animals weighing between 25 and 35 kilos, 40 pound compensation. Animals weighing more than 35 kilos, basically a grower or finisher, 90 pound. Breeding females, gilt or sow, 250 pound. And a breeding male, three, uh, 350 pound. Um, the most common way that DB gets um, found is during routine abattoir meat inspection. So um, if they uh, look at the carcass and find suspected lesion, they will then do tests. Uh, you're okay until those tests come back positive. Um, so if the bacteria M. bovis has been found in the laboratory sample of your animal, um, all other animals, oh, sorry, um, if TV has been found in other groups of animals kept on your farm or cattle or animals kept on, kept on a neighbouring premise, uh, you will probably have restrictions put uh, put upon you. Um, uh, and that's about it, really. I don't really have a great deal more information, but I can answer some questions if anyone's got any, hopefully. I've got a couple more slides, and then I guess we'll go to questions, if that's OK. I can't see anybody now. So I'll um I'll just quickly let you know some bits that we've got coming up. Um so a member of our um bureau team is working with DEFRA on a project to preserve small um abattoirs. So um we I know that you already have um one in place um with the charity um uh, abattoir map but we've got one that's come in um as part of the sustainable food trust um and we're building um it to encompass sort of um cross sector as well so it will cover um beef and lamb um and it will provide a list of options for you to take your pigs you've got a, a number of filters how far you'll prefer to travel um and pop your postcode in um, that's going to be that's very close to being ready um, and that will be communicated out via practical pigs um, and our next um, small scale meeting is 21st and 28th on feed efficiency and we're hoping for a bit of an update um, on that as well and then the um, pork box scheme and the education programme so that um, is again very close to being ready. Um, and that's our main focus for the small scale producer meetings um, in June. 
So um, watch this space with those. Thank you, Emily. Um, and then I guess the last the last slide really is just our contact details there. Um, for, for technical support, um, you've got myself, Andrew and Pat. Um, and any topic requests for the small scale stuff going forwards, then uh, pop feed it back to your uh, regional managers or pop it over to me personally um, with our next meetings, um, 21st, 28th, doing feed for efficiency, feeding for efficiency. And as I said, sorry, I'm just repeating myself, <laughs> the meat education programme on uh, the 9th and 16th of June. Thank you, Emily. So, yes, sorry, I had to step away for a second there when you were, I thought I had time to get away and get back, but uh, I didn't. So there's been a few questions come in. So I saw around the map, Is it, it doesn't look like AHDB cover Scotland, but they do England and Wales. Um, is there a equivalent for you up in Scotland, do you know? Is there a, you know, an AHDB Scotland per se or? So um, we've, there's a QMS um quality meet scotland um and they are our equivalent up there right. um so there's certainly um certainly the opportunity to um speak with them um about that that's good to know so and also one of the quick the the talk on levy pay was really interesting and a couple of people have asked that you know Although we're small scale pig producers, do, do we still class as a levy payer because we're sending our pigs through an abattoir? Yeah, yeah. You still, you're still levy payers. And are we? Would we still qualify for the uh, sort of TB payouts as well for pigs and stuff like that, even though we're uh, small scale? Does that still cover us, or do we need particular insurance for that, or something like that? Believe. Uh uh, yeah, I believe that that, that, that does cover you as well. Yeah, and that. something I did forget to say, we do have quite a lot of information on our website uh, to do with TV in pigs. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of links as well, and there's a lot of information on there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, obviously, you know, with, I guess so with COVID and stuff, I mean, certainly myself as a... Uh, small scale producer i've certainly seen had a lot of interest in you know have i got sausages have i got eggs have i got bacon you know can you do this can you do that because the supermarkets were short etc and you're sliding around you know popularity of cuts showing pork shoulder being up, up the top there as well obviously i mean that's around prime cuts i mean do you have any more figures around um you know other pig other pig products rather than um you know, basic pork cuts. So things like sausages, bacon, gammons, joints, you know, charcuterie and stuff like that. I mean, has AHDB got any sort of data around those sales given the uh, um, current climate, etc.? Yeah, yeah. And it's something that we can, um, I'll look into because we have um, different... <sighs> I can't think of the, the name of the um, survey. I don't know if you can, Pat. Um, I think we do, yeah. So I'll certainly look, look into it. No, I'm just interested to see, you know, obviously, you know, and the, obviously the, the prices that you advertise are obviously based on, you know, the £3.31 £3 per kilo is obviously based upon mainstream pig production, you know, for pig, pig producers. Is there a way to distinguish, I guess? I mean, I know from my reports that I get back from um, the abattoir, I don't distinguish that it's a rare breed pig. So, you know, are there numbers there, do you know, that, where you could compare those stats specifically for, you know, rare breed pork? Not that I'm aware of at the moment, but again, it's something that I can ask. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Em. I've not seen any report or comparison for, for, not for a definite split okay thank you so there's a few more questions about tb and around 
you know, if you do have a, because um, I know with cows, if it's test positive, the, the animal gets slaughtered and can't be used for meat, you know, um, does that same apply for pork? Yes, it, it would be condemned and disposed of on the farm. It would be cold on the farm. Cold, cold on the farm, right, I yeah. see what you're saying, rather than... Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, I understand. So, and and sorry if I missed this. Is is the TB testing process the same as it is for cattle? I'm going to say yes, um, but there are other uh, means being tested. So, uh, but yeah, I believe it is. Okay. That's um, an interesting one because I mean it's not not something I've heard a huge amount around. It's good to it's good to know that there's a, a potential issue there. But uh, yeah. I mean, I have got two units that have got DB at the moment or are just coming out of it. They've had their uh, last test and have, have come clear. But um, as an example, uh, they because they couldn't send their pigs to uh, their usual slaughterhouse, they couldn't fulfill their contract. So instead of, at the time, it was probably nearly 165 a kilo, yeah. they were actually being offered 110 a kilo. Right. They were then having to sell all their offspring at a loss. That's, I guess that's, that's quite common, I guess, when you're looking at market prices, etc. Um, so a very good question here come in. So around levy pairs. So uh, I'll, I'll share an experience that I had um, earlier this week, actually. I used one of my local abattoirs. who's also... Um, fairly mainstream and deals with um, um, big big orders as well. But typically on a Tuesday, it's private kill day because of a bank holiday. Anyway, I normally get to the abattoir about quarter past six, um, and I know I'm the first one in. But I wasn't. I was, they had obviously opened earlier because of the bank holiday weekend, and I was stuck behind a dirty grey, you know, load of some of the region of 200 pigs on a big thing, and I waited an hour and a quarter to sort of get through that but I do have a local smaller abattoir that I can use as well um, and the small abattoirs are getting few and far between is there anything that's happening with the money that comes from the levy of slaughter of animals to help support those smaller scale abattoirs where the likes of us small scale producers can just sort of turn up and leave our pigs without feeling like we're holding up a queue of you know um, trucks coming in I, I don't think, and unless you want to answer this, M, but it's it, it's certainly not a role or a, a way that we would be allowed, I don't believe, to spend uh, right. this money. Would you agree, M? Um, so I wasn't aware of the work, but and, until this interactive avatar map was highlighted to us, um, but there is work going on there um, with the Sustainable Food Trust to preserve them. Um, so it's a case of um, certainly watching this space for a bit more information to come out about it because it was it was news to us as well. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, it is, I mean, stuff. Our, my personal local small laboratory has been there 120 odd years and it's a it's, it's a tiny little place, it doesn't handle a few volumes, you know, it's got a butcher's next to it that sort of keeps it going and it's kind of nice to be able to support them. And I use the other abattoir for different reasons this time, but um, yeah, and you know, but you do hear of, you know, especially when COVID hit, a lot of these small abattoirs were sort of closed and now small scale producers had to go to the bigger abattoirs and we couldn't get anything in because they weren't interested in us because you know it's two or three pigs rather than 200 pigs so that you know for them the return wasn't there don't feel that you were being victimized there though because a lot oh, of that is not that is not what i'm applying whatsoever no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of saying that you know but a lot of the larger producers in the country would have had exactly the same problem they couldn't okay. get pigs into slaughterhouses that's that's also interesting to know so uh Okay, thank you. Um, is it another question about mobile abattoirs? I mean, I know I've seen, 
I know in Australia and New Zealand, it's quite common to have these sort of mobile people that come around, slaughter the animal on your premises and butcher it for you there and then. I mean, is there such a thing across the UK that um, is common and supported by, um, you know, um, well, not specifically AHDB, but the actual the whole pork, the whole livestock sector? There are certainly mobile uh, slaughterers but it's not it's not anything that we have anything to do with it's not in our remit okay thank but you there are, there are certainly uh, and there are certainly mobile slaughterers yeah thank you um i've had a lot of questions come through so thank you everyone that's on the um on, on the call if i have missed your question could you please repost it because there are uh, a few recurring questions with a similar topic so if I haven't quoted you specifically, it's because there's been an, another question there. So um, are there any more questions? I mean, I guess we can open it up now if you want to take your microphone off and, and ask, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to. All right, I'll ask something then. I'm just going to ask about the TB thing again. I was just wondering that you're talking about the testing itself, but is there a likelihood? Because obviously with cattle, there's a mandatory testing thing where they have to be tested. So it, if it's on the increase in pigs, is it is that likely to extend to pigs? I know other, uh, other. I don't believe it is. Certainly not at the moment because it's so. Uh, it is uncommon in pigs. Uh, so yeah, I, I I I've not heard of any suggestions about mandatory than a pig okay. and it is something that uh, the vets and I think anybody any um, bodies in pigs would certainly fight because I mean it's you know you're, you're not talking about coming in and testing a um, hundred cattle you're potentially talking about going in and testing two three four five thousand pigs Does that answer your question, Tracy? Sorry, I'm mute. Um, yes, it does. Thank you. I just wanted to be sure that wasn't. No, no, that's corner. fine. Sorry, <laughs> I had missed that. So, uh, another good question here for um, so as a non so people in Scotland that are um, obviously they're not English levy players, etc. Are they still able to attend these AHDB small producer meetings and stuff that we have? You know, I mean, I, from the that perspective is a question that's been asked. Help if I could unmute. Yes, um, yeah, it's something that um, we've had a bit of uh, iffy um, around training because it's slightly different, um, but certainly for the digital, um, we haven't got any qualms with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more, I mean, I think a lot of the information is fairly consistent, isn't it? It's just that there are nuances, differences with legalities in different in different countries that make some sort of small changes. It's, it, yeah, it, it was a good question, you know. And I do feel, I mean, having attended, a, having registered with Pig Pro, even though I'm not part of a training program, I've attended a couple of the um, AHDB seminars, which are very good. Um, you know, you do get the credit on there. You know, I, I think it's a good program. I mean, I don't need a certificate for it, but it's good to go back and know what sort of scene, what you, um, what sort of what you've been through. Um, one other question with sheep: obviously, they have the EID tags. Do we see a similar thing for pigs in the future? Do you think, or will it stay as sort of slap marks and generic slaughter tags for um, pig slaughter? Not same a load of question, by the way. <laughs> same, same again. Um, I don't believe there's any legislation in the pipeline at the moment to say that pigs will have to be uh, have EID tags, but that's not to say it won't come in the future. Okay, thank you. So, um. I've got no more questions coming through, so um, if anyone's got another question, please pipe up. Um, I just so, want to... Oh, I'm sorry. Harry, uh, so away. On the, on the, uh, the sort of new uh, EA2 
website, there's uh, a, a new box which is about the closed hooves. Um, the, do you know what I mean? You seen that? Yeah. To ask if they come in contact with closed closed hoof creatures. So I'm guessing that's to do with the tuberculosis. Um, so could could we have some more information about that, perhaps? Uh, I'm not sure that it's just to do with TB. Um, it's, I know if um, export any meat, or any uh, any of the pork carcass now, there has to be a vet certificate saying that it hasn't come into contact with any other, uh, with any cloven hoof animals. I'm not totally sure that that's completely to do with TB, but I'm not 100% certain. I mean, we can we can uh, look that up, Ben, can't we, and, and, and find out a definitive answer. And there's a bit more um, information. We went into the movement licences and those questions in a bit more depth on the national. So it might be just worth having maybe a quick look over um, that because that, if it isn't up by now, it will be by next week, the recording of the national. Yeah, I mean, I mean that. I mean that. That was a question that was covered on the small scale producers um, meeting. If I recall correctly, Emily. Um, yes. Yeah. So there was three changes to the movement license that could confuse us small scale producers, and it really only applies to if you're exporting your livestock outside of the UK. So you just yeah. say. One is asking for a valid vet, quarterly vet certificate. You just say no to, and all the and all the other ones you just say no to because um, you're not exporting it. Therefore, you're sort of um, exempt. But if you're unsure about that on the form, I'm not trying to detract from Emily or Patrick. Here, you're probably better off speaking to Nikki, uh, AHTB, not AHTB, EAML. Sorry, um, I've got that um, this slide here. Perfect, yeah. Andrew, there's some information. I've lost who asked the question, sorry. Um, but oh, there's, Harry Bell there's certain... the question, yes. Yeah. Harry, yes. Um, if you've got a number, an email there, and they're ever so useful. Hmm. Also, if you remember, Harry, I think you missed it when, because Nicola um, actually was on, um, she did a podcast and a Zoom for us earlier this year, and she went through the whole movement licence and she explained exactly all the three things that Emily and um, Andrew have just gone through. And the, those three issues were, um, for want of a better word, exempt from us as smallholders because it was to do with the exporting. So, there, so if you want to, there is on the podcast from on our website, you've got the whole talk from Nicola again, as well as the stuff here that Emily's just shown you here on the screen to go through and listen to what Nicola had to say. Yeah, thanks, Kim. And also to point out that we did a similar session with Scott EID as well um, around that. And it's a similar podcast around the movement process and changes in Scotland too. So um, always, always good to work the opportunity. I'm getting a fair few messages here saying um, thank you to Emily and Patrick for a very uh, intuitive evening around the information you've provided. Thank you very much. Um, so that's always nice to hear. And I personally, you know, I appreciate your input as well and taking the time on a, on, on a Thursday evening to talk to us. Are there any more questions? Okay, then I will say thank you very much, Emily, for your time. Thank you very much. Patrick for your time uh, very much appreciated well thank you very much for tuning in um, that's it for this episode um, as always if you'd like to be on a podcast or feature um, just like to have a chat anything related to pigs pork um, you know Oxford Sandy and Black etc please do drop me an email andrew at Oxford Sandy and Black Pig Group org or direct message me on the group or tag me at a post in the group I'm happy to reach out um, we can do so much um, via Zoom to record the audio. So those that are a little bit camera shy, you don't need to worry. Your, you know, your picture's not going to be put out there. It's purely an audio session. So that would be great if anyone is interested. Um, anyway, that's it. Until next time, I've been Andrew O'Shea. Happy pig keeping. <laughs>